and this is for the benefit of anybody who is here that uh, uh, if you're new to Unreal Engine, uh, I don't want to take very much for granted. But if I were to be starting a brand new, pro uh, brand new project right now, that'd be the first thing that I would do is I would go to my dock down here. Of course, now this uh, go-to meeting thing is covering it up. But I would launch my Epic uh, launcher, typically. And uh, you can see that, uh, I think it was just yesterday, in fact, that uh, uh, if I go to my library tab, it was only yesterday that, uh, that a hotfix came out for uh, Unreal Engine, the, the full release of Unreal Engine 5, and I have yet to update. The reason is that I had a presentation yesterday as well as a presentation today, and I had some stuff prepared in case I got to it. Uh, in case I had the chance to get to it, I mean, and I just was not that confident updating considering all the preparation of that I had done. After uh, tonight's uh, presentation, I'm going to update my Unreal Engine 5. In any case, uh, that is my current version right here. And of course, uh, hopefully you know that you can have as many uh, un uh, versions of Unreal on your computer as you like, uh, according to your storage. Uh, I have some projects underway in this version. And uh, at my work computer, I've got a version of 4.27 installed, as well as the most current version of 5.0.2, soon to be whatever it becomes after I update it. But I'm not prepared to update yet. And you can change what is set to current just by using this drop down here. So if I wanted to use this launch button to launch the older version, I could, I could do that, or I can switch it here. Uh, so that I only have to worry about this one button, or I can launch them from their respective launch buttons. It really doesn't matter. Let's launch uh, my current version uh, of Unreal. And I'm going to try to pull this way down again so it doesn't get in the way of too much. Okay. So uh, I'm assuming that uh, I, I, as far as I know, everybody here... Uh, right now has some experience in Unreal Engine 4, at least, maybe some in Unreal Engine 5, but this is the, uh, the, the new project browser. And uh, we're going to make a new game tonight, so we're going to click on the Games tab, and just like uh, Unreal Engine 4, it comes with an assortment of templates uh, and other categories, uh, templates for film, video, and live events, and film templates for arc, excuse me, uh, uh, templates for architecture and automotive product design and manufacturing. Uh, if you've used Unreal Engine for a long time, you probably know that it doesn't especially matter what template you start with, uh, although very often a uh, third person template is a, a pretty good choice because you have the mannequin in there and that gives you a sense of scale. So I usually start my projects with that. You can import content from any of these other uh, uh, template packs uh, if you need that stuff. For example, if I needed the, the features of the car template in this project, I could, of course, import those. So it's not especially important. You also know that uh, uh, Unreal Engine is largely based on C++ and that Blueprint is the visual scripting system that is used by many in uh, you know, Unreal project development. Blueprint is based on C++. And uh, if you do not have a background in like syntax-based programming, I think that Blueprint is a very good access point to learning about certain general program programming concepts. Uh, and indeed, Blueprint is, in certain respects, uh, it's just one level of abstraction higher than C++ and is very much based on C++. So it's a very good entryway to learning about programming logic. And you can do just about anything in Blueprint. It's, it's really remarkable. So we don't have to change any of the settings here because it does default to the Blueprint option. You should know that if you're also a C++ user, you can use C++ in a Blueprint uh, project and vice versa. So you're not locking yourself into one system or the other, but uh, uh, this just sets up certain things that they're uh, ergonomically prepared for uh, a, bl a Blueprint user. 
We're going to call this something. We'll call this uh, uh, test underscore 007 because I know that I've got uh, lots of projects called test this or that, and I doubt that I have seven of them. So uh, we'll just call this test 007. If you're new to Unreal Engine, you should know that in giving a project a name, uh, uh, spaces are not allowed, although underscores are. Uh, upper and lower case uh, uh, text is okay, as are numbers, okay? There might be some other uh, uh, rules about this, like special characters. I don't think I could add a question mark, for example. You see that this gave uh, me an error here, okay? Uh, project names may not contain the following characters. So it'll tell you if you've, if you've typed something that is uh, not valid for a project name. So this is okay with me as long as I can remember it tonight. Uh, test 007, and we're going to hit create. And uh, uh, I'm sure you know that uh, if you have been using Unreal Engine for uh, any substantial period of time, you probably already know, excuse me, I'll update this. I'm also going to open up the Manage Plugins tab here for a second, and there's a reason for that. Uh, you, you probably know that uh, if you have a brand new install of any version of the engine, this has at least been my experience, and I like to uh, caution people about this if they have just gotten Unreal and they're just getting into this, is usually the very first time you launch the editor, it takes a lot longer for it to fully load up uh, compared to subsequent attempts. So uh, what I like to advise people to do in general, and would encourage you all to do the same if you are advocating for Unreal uh, to other people, is tell them to get what they need, guide them in getting the Epic Launcher, how to install Unreal, how to install um, you know, you know, the free assets, use the marketplace and whatnot. Uh, just tell them that before they even get started, just launch it once, wait for it to seem like it has crashed, which it hasn't in most cases. Oftentimes it gets stuck at a certain percentage of loading. Uh, some popular ones are 45% and 90% or whatever, but it seems like it's stopped and usually it's not stopped. It's just got a lot to compile and the best thing you can do is just walk away and come back later. Uh, I've seen it take well over an hour and frankly, I've never timed it, but uh, there have been times where I've installed new versions of the engine and just figured, okay, this is going to take forever, so I'll come back tomorrow. I tend to do that at night just before bedtime. Uh, so I hear somebody piping in. Uh, well, I was going to say, I don't miss the laptop life. <laughs> this is a laptop, I have to admit. This is a nice laptop. It's an Alienware uh, dev laptop, but it's nowhere near as powerful as what you've got access to. Uh, all right, so uh, the reason that I've got my plugins open is because I'm going to enable something that is not enabled by default yet in Unreal Engine 5. I don't know if it is in the uh, update that was released yesterday, but uh, if you still have 5.0.2, you're going to have to enable a certain plugin, and it's called Metasound. So I'll just search for it. Uh, and if I just type Meta, you'll find it, okay? It does say that it's beta. I guess that's technically true. Uh, I think it's robust. I think it's working well. Uh, but you can see it's not enabled by default. And if you've used uh, Unreal Engine for audio before, you know that the uh, primary asset type is... Uh, the sound cue, um, and if you really have some experience uh, in Unreal Engine, uh, you might uh, appreciate the good aspects of sound cues and yet be frustrated by other aspects of sound cues, uh, especially with regard to the parameterization of certain aspects of your sound. Uh, Metasound uh, is much more flexible in that regard, and also Metasound has capabilities that sound cues do not have such as uh, legitimate DSP and modular synthesis capabilities. Actually, designing sound in Engine is now much more of a possibility than it ever has been. 
We're not going to be doing that tonight. That's a little bit uh, advanced, but we're going to, I think tonight's talk is going to be more about the transition from sound cues to using MetaSound for the things that maybe we're already familiar with. So we're going to enable the plugin, and for those of you who enable plugins now and then, you know that it always requires a restart of the editor. So that will prompt you. So if you have other plugins that you want to enable now, now would be a good time because that would only take one restart. So I just need MetaSound in this case. So we're going to hit restart now, and then this will uh, restart in no time. So you can see how quickly this is going because, of course, I've opened up this version of Unreal lots of times, and uh, uh, there we go. Okay. Now, the plugins window, if you needed it to be open for any length of time, maybe you could dock it. Anything that has a tab is dockable, uh, but we no longer need this, so I'm going to close the plugins tab. If you're using the default editor layout for Unreal Engine 5, it may not look exactly like mine does because I've docked my content browser just because of uh, it being something that I'm used to and uh, using it often. Uh, but the default editor layout is going to look something more like this if you're opening up Unreal Engine 5 for the first time. And uh, we have a uh, keyboard shortcut, which is a command spacebar for opening up that content browser. Oh, I've got this, uh, excuse me, let me just hit escape for a second. If you move this out of the way, you can see that we also have a button for it, Content Browser. And if you want it to remain in your layout, you can just dock it. Just click that Dock and Layout uh, button, and there it will stay. If you're coming from Unreal Engine 4, likewise, you're probably used to having the Place Actors panel right about here, okay? Now, the Place Actors functions are still all available uh, here under this dropdown. But if you're uh, a little bit more at home as I am uh, by, having it, uh, ha by having things be where I expect them to be, as I transition from 4 to 5, I like having that there just because it, it just looks a little bit more like what I'm used to. If you ever get your panels way out of whack, just like in Unreal Engine 4 under Window, you can go down to Load Layout and use the default editor layout, and that will reset everything back to uh, the default settings. So once again, I'm going to make my uh, content browser visible, dock it, and from my own preferences, I'm going to leave the Place Actors pa uh, panel in place. So in the third person template here, you can see that we've got a different arena. They're calling it the playground now. I think before they called it the arena in Unreal Engine 4. Uh, and uh, many of the things are the same. Uh, if you hit uh, Alt-P or Option-P, you can go into play, or you can hit the play button here to play right in your viewport. OK. Uh, what I usually like to do, this is a personal, a personal preference, is to click these three dots, these three dots, I beg your pardon, and choose a new editor window. When you do this, it will open a new window, window which you can then maximize and play the game in full screen. Uh, as you're uh, uh, making progress. The nice thing about that is that once you've done that once, if I click the play button again, it has remembered my preference, okay? And in this default template, you can see that there is some content. We have a skeletal, uh, well, what we have is a, actually a full character. We're looking at the skeletal mesh right now. And uh, this is uh, one of just a couple that come with uh, uh, the uh, third person template. The one that we're looking at right now is a character called Quinn, which is a play on words because Quinn is the second half of the word mannequin. And uh, there's another one that comes with the template, and I want to show that to you. So if I go into the uh, root content directory, we'll find the third person folder. And inside of there, we have uh, a blueprints subdirectory, and I can open that up. And we'll find the default third-person game mode asset right there, and also our uh, character. Uh, there's a player start, as you can see, in the world, and I'm sure that in the game mode, our default pawn class is this uh, BP third-person uh, character. So let's open up our character blueprint by double-clicking, 
And of course, I can dock this if I wish. That way, it's easy to go back and forth between my normal viewport and just looking at the blueprint. OK, so this is the event graph, and uh, this is all fine. Uh, but I want to point something out that uh, if I go back here to the viewport tab, and if you don't hit, if you don't see if some of these tabs got closed accidentally, just do that trick that I showed you before of going to window, load layout, and default editor layout, and everything will come back like the way it's supposed to. So I'm in the viewport tab here, and if I select the mesh component, I can change that skeletal mesh. Like I said, it comes with two. Actually, it comes with four in a sense, but I'm going to change this to, actually, it comes with five. One, two, three, four, five. I beg your pardon. I'm going to change this to Manny, and if you've spent time in Unreal Engine, you probably already know that Manny is the nickname for the uh, uh, skeletal mesh for our uh, humanoid mannequin. Looks, uh, this new one, by the way, is, I think, nicer looking than what we had in Unreal Engine 4. Also, their skeletons have more bones in them, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the, that's relevant to animations and things of that nature. So I think that these new uh, characters uh, do look very good. It turns out that we are provided with animation blueprints for both of them. Quinn has one, and Manny has one. And if I change to the Manny uh, uh, blueprint here, uh, you'll notice that as soon as that I click that, uh, the, the posture or pose is going to change some, uh, somewhat because those are two different body types and the animations are a little bit different for both. Compile and save. And if I close this tab and go back into play, you'll see that I'm now playing as Manny and not Gwen. Uh, if you decide to get into playing uh, as other characters other than Manny or Quinn, that is a whole other lesson because the retargeting process for Unreal Engine 5 is frankly different from Unreal Engine 4. Uh, I'm happy to have that uh, conversation if anybody wants to, uh, but uh, today we're not going to worry about that so much. Okay, so let's look at some uh, generic types of examples. One of the first things that I like to take care of early in a project are basic like things like Foley. Okay, Foley uh, primarily refers to footsteps and uh, can also include things like uh, cloth, uh, things like clothing on the body of the character, uh, things of that nature. But originally the idea of Foley was for footsteps in particular. Now, what footsteps ought to sound like, of course, is going to depend largely on what is being walked upon, right? And we have this default uh, grid material on here right now. So hopefully uh, those of you who are watching this have some familiarity with the idea of using materials in Unreal Engine and uh, uh, PBR materials in general. Uh, uh, if also, if you happen to be a user of Unreal Engine and you have an Epic Games account, you're very, very fortunate whether you realize it or not, because you now have access through Quixel Bridge to everything that Quixel has scanned. And that includes materials, landscape materials, uh, uh, mesh files, all sorts of stuff. It's just a great resource. I'm not going to bother wasting time importing things, uh, downloading things into this session today. So we're going to make use of the materials that are provided to us, let's say, in starter content today, because we're talking about using this in principle more than anything else. So we're going to go into our root content directory once again. And let's do this. We'll go into starter content, which does provide some PBR materials here in this materials folder. We can open that up and we can see these are not like up to the level of Quixel scan, you know, Quixel materials, which are higher resolution textures and so forth. But uh, the best way to think of a material, if you're not that familiar with them in the first place, is they're sort of like wrapping paper. OK, the objects that are in our uh, playground are our arena here. These objects here are. 3D models, which are usually referred to as static mesh assets, static mesh, as opposed to something like a character mesh, something like that mannequin that I showed you before. Those are also mesh files, but they're skeletal meshes, and uh, they are not um, 
uh, just objects that do not uh, change uh, in terms of, uh, for example, a character has joints and bones and uh, not everything stays the same shape all the time. Sometimes it bends its elbow or sometimes it raises a leg and so forth. So a skeletal mesh uh, is more common for things with moving parts and static meshes are for things that don't have moving parts. I think that's a pretty good way of uh, thinking about it. But uh, uh, if we take this floor here and I just click on it, I'm in select mode, okay? And here is the mode selector and we default to select mode. If I just simply select that, we can see that it's nothing more than a cube static mesh actor that's been scaled out to be the floor of our playground. And uh, you can see here that uh, if I scroll down in the materials, excuse me, in the details panel, I can find uh, where I can apply a material. For example, I can go, let's do uh, burnished steel. I can just drag that onto there. And now it's burnished steel. Likewise, uh, we can usually just drag materials right onto the meshes themselves. Let's say I wanted my, my floor to be gold. And yes, indeed, there are better gold materials out there to be had. This is just starter content and it's fine, okay? Uh, no, I don't think I want the floor to be cold in this case. So why don't we make an environment here that is made of wood? Some of the wood textures that come in here, not textures, materials, I beg your pardon. I should point out that uh, PBR uh, materials oftentimes start with a texture sample, something like a JPEG file or a PNG for their base color. And uh, there are also textures provided for things like normal maps, etc. materials. But uh, to remember, today is mostly about sound, but of course it does matter what things are made out of or appear to be made out of in order for those sounds to really uh, keep the illusion uh, consistent. So I'm just going to apply this uh, wood material to all of the geometry in this particular scene. And this is not difficult at all. I'm just, uh, I'm using uh, right mouse button and WASD to navigate the environment. And of course I can do this here or again by selecting the mesh, finding where the materials uh, element is and just dragging it there. This I find a little bit just easier to do, so faster. Uh, I should point out that PBR materials, uh, unless you take certain steps, they do stretch um, depending on the scale and things like that of the mesh. I'm not so much going to worry about that today. And of course, there are ways to fix that so that it stays consistent. Uh, so it appears to be like made out of the same uh, lumber, I guess, to, uh, regardless of what the size is. Uh, we'll see some of that uh, uh, texture stretching, uh, I think, probably as we look at some of these larger meshes. But it's not too bad with this wood. So uh, we've got this uh, cool wooden environment. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to make these out of wood. Uh, maybe we can make them out of something fantastical, like, uh, I don't know, that stuff. <laughs> okay, so that's cute. All right, so we go back into our level and now we've got uh, a whole different environment. There is no sound yet, but uh, it's wood, okay? And if I make some footsteps, uh, it should sound like they are uh, in, in, to a certain degree wooden. Now, of course, the way that we would do this uh, in the old way uh, would be, let's say maybe I'll go back to my content root directory and I will make a new folder and I will call it, um, custom audio underscore oh one. I might have more than one folder for custom audio. So inside of here, we'll make another subfolder for Foley footsteps. And into that folder, we're going to import our wave assets. Now, if you're coming from Unreal Engine 4, you may recall that there used to be, um, uh, it, it used to be the case that the files that you were to push over into or import into here could be either 16-bit PCM WAV files uh, at a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz. To the best of my knowledge right now, uh, and maybe Grace can confirm this, uh, as far as I know, 
the sampling rate no longer is a limitation, yet it's still recommended for your files to be 16-bit or already compressed as Ogvorbis, okay? That's to the best of my knowledge right now. 16-bit uh, audio, just for your information, that's in reference to the quantization word length. Uh, and uh, it is the same quantization resolution or bit depth. Uh, not bit rate, bit rate is something different, but bit, it's sort of a pet peeve of mine, but bit depth or the quantization word length is the, exactly the same 16 bit as a CD. Uh, so if you've ever listened to a CD that you thought sounded great, then you already know that 16 bit audio is capable of sounding fantastic okay uh, as a matter of fact the uh, uh, word length in this case 16 bit mainly determines dynamic range of audio signals mainly and it also determines uh, the attenuation of the quantization noise floor but it's unlikely that you would ever hear that okay the only way to hear the quantization noise in a 16 bit audio is to listen to the last like 200 250 milliseconds of a fade out where there's nothing else present but the fade out with your speakers or headphones turned up dangerously loudly so that you can hear the quantization artifacts during those last few milliseconds of the fade out. Under normal uh, circumstances, you're playing back your audio at such a level, let's say you're listening at 85 dB SPL. Well, the noise floor, uh, the digital noise floor in 16-bit audio is about, 97, is about about 97 dB down. Okay, idealized. If that's just a rounding. Uh, but uh, still, uh, if you were listening to your music at 85 dB SPL, which is fairly common and fairly loud, it puts the quantization artifacts under the threshold of hearing anyway. So if you're worried at all, I mean, not to mention masking, but if you were worried at all about hearing quantization artifacts, please accept the fact that they are below the threshold of hearing in this case, unless you are actually listening at a high enough level and in an isolated enough way so as to damage your hearing, which nobody ever recommends. So 16-bit 44.1 is capable of great, great sound. My understanding, though, is while it still should be 16-bit, I wouldn't exceed 48 kilohertz personally. I, I think it's diminishing returns, especially with oversampling converters. We, you know, th there's very little argument to using very high sampling rates, especially in video games. Uh, everything has to be loaded up into memory that's being used, and uh, high definition sampling rates like 96 kilohertz, 192 kilohertz, really are not efficient, okay? Uh, we have to keep in mind bit budgeting here and performance. And uh, oftentimes in a dev team, uh, you're gonna find that other departments might need more memory and usually where they get it from is by informing the audio department, uh, sorry, you're gonna have to uh, do something with your audio to make more memory available for something else. So, uh, yeah, I don't recommend, you know, trying to high resolution uh, sampling rate everything in a game project these days. I just don't think it is necessary personally. Okay, so now we've got this new environment. And, of course, I could switch out the character, but doing that in Unreal Engine 5 takes longer than in Unreal Engine 4. Oh, it looks like I missed a spot for that material, which is no big deal. I can come back and fix that. So let's quickly do that. We'll go, uh, go back into starter content. And what is this stuff? It's wood walnut. Okay, so let me just browse to the asset. And we're going to find, oh, I beg your pardon. We're going to find what I missed, which was right there, and fix that right up. Okay, so if you've ever done character foley before, uh, perhaps, excuse me, perhaps you already know that that is uh, uh, done through mostly most of the time there's no one only one way to do anything in unreal engine uh, but uh, most of the time it's driven by animations so if we go to content and we go into our uh, i think it's in this case the characters folder you can see that there are two subdirectories one of them says mannequin ue4 and that's the traditional white uh, mannequin that we uh, have as a legacy from unreal engine 4. this is very very useful for converting characters into uh, uh, the new Unreal Engine 5 format. 
Uh, however, the mannequin, uh, the uh, SK mannequin skeleton, me skeletal mesh, I beg your pardon, that we've been playing as is inside this folder. So we're going to open up mannequins. And uh, we already looked at the mesh. Okay, we've got uh, SK mannequin, uh, that's going to be our, oh, excuse me, SKM skeletal mesh manny. We've looked at that and we've looked at SKM Quinn. And then there's physics assets and skeletons and stuff. We know about that. Um, but there's also animations, okay? And there's uh, an animation blueprint. ABP underscore Manny is the animation blueprint for the Manny character. And ABP Quinn is the animation blueprint for Quinn. You should know that uh, this is a child blueprint of Manny. So it will inherit from Manny. Okay, so uh, most of the time we're just going to make our edits here in the uh, uh, Manny Blueprint. Uh, if I go into the Manny Blueprint, if I open that up, just like uh, uh, any other animation blueprint, you can go to the Anim Graph and see certain familiar things. One thing that you're probably very used to is the Locomotion State Machine. This particular one is real simple, uh, I found out, because it just has the entry point, an idle state, and uh, there's a blend space in here that goes from walk to run and back and transition rules that just make it really, really simple. I like that. Uh, so uh, I don't really have to change anything there necessarily unless I import other animations. Uh, what I might do is go back to the root of the anim graph. Uh, oh, no, it's already got, you know what, this is cool. It already comes with the uh, default slot if I have to do any uh, slot-based montages. So that actually comes with the animation blueprint, so that's wonderful. Uh, and there aren't very many animations uh, that come with the character. Of course, I can add as many as I want, but let's just close that for the time being. We can see that there are these other folders along with their animation blueprints, and they contain probably what you'd expect them to contain, the individual animation sequences uh, and also one blend space in this case that are used in that blueprint. Now, in order to do Foley based on animations, uh, we're going to be making the making use of skeleton notifies. So all of these things that are relevant, okay? MM prefix stands for mannequin male unders underscore walk forward, uh, run forward, land, jump, all the things that you're used to seeing in, uh, uh, you know, starting animation blueprints. But we do have to put the notifies in there just like we used to. Uh, this walk in place, uh, this one, I don't think we ever really see, but I suppose uh, uh, if, it, if it turns out that it's part of that one blend space, uh, I might as well put the notifies in there. There's some notifies here right now, uh, and frankly, I don't know, uh, they're not even the type of notify that I want. I like the skeleton, the skeleton notifies for this purpose. So here under notifies, we're going to just add an extra track and I can name it, even name it footfalls. <laughs> of course, my caps lock embarrasses me right now. Okay, so let's just do it. <laughs> Easier said than done. Come on, rename. My mouse is uh, right click is not is not working right now. Okay, select all footfalls. <laughs> okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, so let's just use our uh, mouse and arrow keys, and maybe I'll lower my camera speed to a three for this, so I don't spaz out too much. Maneuver so that you can see their feet. And just like before, we can use the scrubber uh, just to see where the footfalls are located. And I'm going to use my footfalls notify track. Okay, so we're going to find a foot down there. Okay, and on that uh, cursor line, I'm going to choose add notify, new, no new notify for the very first time. And I can give it the name that I want, footfall. Some people do this for the left and right foot. I personally hardly ever do. I think it's fine just to have the notifies as they are. Now I'm going to look for the other foot down, the next one. And we're going to recycle the same skeleton notify that we that we uh, had before. So we'll go back to add notify. Again, that's right clicking. I don't have to do new to, new notify this time because I already have made a footfall notify, which I'm going to recycle. So let's uh, move forward to the next foot down. I think it's right about there, and we'll recycle the same notify. Excuse me. 
sometimes it's hard to keep that menu open I find there's the right foot going down I don't know that this animation is is used very much it's probably if anywhere it's at the very beginning of that blend space so this might be uh, moot for this particular animation but we do have to do all of them where footfalls are going to be uh, requiring a sound to accompany them. So uh, uh, let's not overlook them. These animation sequences also have, seems like more cycles than they did in Unreal Engine 4. So you're going to find yourself adding more notifies than you're accustomed to. Uh, not more in the sense of a greater quantity of notifies. Uh, and uh, th these are all the same notify. Uh, but uh, just having to add in more uh, instances of them. So I'm going to do a footfall there, and that's it. Okay, so we can now, you can see, save this animation. We can even save it right here by highlighting it and hitting Command S. And now we'll go to, uh, we'll make sure that we're using the right ones. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, mail mannequin walk forward, okay, and we're still positioned in the same way that we were. I can use my scrubber, and guess what? We can even reuse the same notifies we already made. Let's make a new notify track, and we can call this footfalls. It's fine. Notifies, by the way, can be used for all kinds of other clever things, okay? But in this case, we're using them almost like metadata within the animation to flag when it's time to do some kind of code. So uh, skeleton notify, I still have my footfall. I'm going to recycle that for every one of these steps, okay? And this is not a sound. This is just a flag. Okay, to say when is that footfall taking place, at what frame during the animation. Okay, so add notify, skeleton notifies, footfall, and we'll do the rest of them for the walk animation. Right about there. Add notify. And you can always come back and edit these if it, if it feels like your timing was off a little bit. Oops, excuse me, I made a mistake. If it seems like your timing is not feeling right, you can always come back here and just slide the notifies earlier or later in time as necessary until things seem like they have uh, uh, fallen into place. I'm getting close just by sight here, but part of it is listening and doing it by feel. So let's just finish that at notify, uh, footfall. There might be one more step in here. I think the foot is down by there. Add notify, skeleton notify, footfall, and yeah, that's it. Okay, so we're going to highlight and save that animation, Control S or Command S if you're on a Macintosh. And uh, we don't have to leave this environment anymore. I'm pretty confident about where, what group of animations this is. So let's go to Run, and we'll add another notify track, footfalls. And uh, let's get them all in there. Yeah, you know, it's a little boring, but you know, making a video a video game takes a long time for a reason. There's a lot to do. Not to mention the creation of the sounds themselves. Okay, so uh, this is just getting everything ready in order to implement them. I think uh, just as important as anything else in sound design is implementation skills. So this is the implementation, the most commonly utilized implementation for footsteps. Okay. Notifies. Add notify. Footfall. I'm going to do this for the jump land, I think, as well. Maybe the, yeah, the jump land should be enough. So uh, add notify. Skeleton notify. And the jump land is an animation sequence, if I if that wasn't clear. Okay, one more notify here. Same one, we're just recycling. Let's save that animation. And then there's the jump up. Sometimes I put like foot sounds for that, but I think mainly just so that we don't take up too much time, we'll do it just for the jumping uh, uh, land. Okay, jump land. 
All right, so let's see what happens with the feet there. There is, oh, I think there's just the one, okay? Okay, so right there. Okay, we can make a new notified track if we want. We can name, rename it Footfalls if we want, and I can put that Footfall Notify right there. New Notify. Oh, not new Notify. Uh, we can reuse our Skeleton Notify that we already have for Footfall. Okay, so this should be all the animations right now that require locomotion types of Notifies for Footfalls. Okay. So let's go back to the content directory now. And uh, we've got custom audio Foley footsteps. Uh, we made that directory earlier, although I didn't import any audio assets into this directory yet. So let's go to import. And uh, I might have to look around for this for one second. Uh, you're seeing the guts of the uh, inside of my computer right now. So we're looking for. I think some um, footsteps that I had on here. Let's see. Mm, maybe not here. Steam games, footsteps. I saw a folder called Footfall Waves. Yep, that's the one. Thank you. Okay. No <laughs> and uh, I'll take all of them. They're they're just footfalls that we recorded at uh, you know in class and. Uh, uh, you know, they're on different surface types. As a matter of fact, one of our attendees tonight might recognize his own footsteps because some of these belong to that individual, okay? We followed him around with a shotgun mic on a fishbowl and captured, uh, uh, nope. We got these. Vince, do you recognize your footsteps? Maybe your mic doesn't work. Yeah, here's your here's your thumbs up. I saw it. Okay, so that's you, Vince. <laughs> uh, obviously, we've got asterisks here. So let's select all of these together and hit Command S. Okay, so that we know that they're saved. Okay, so the old way of doing this, the old way of doing this would have been using a sound cue. All right, so sound cues have not been fully removed from our uh, Unreal Engine 5 yet. And that is one way that we can do this. So that, let me remind you how you would do it with the sound cue. So we're going to go to uh, uh, right click and we're going to go to sounds and I'm going to create a sound cue. And we're going to call this footfalls underscore cue. That makes sense to me. Uh, and open that up. Okay. As a matter of fact, you can see it has a tab. That means that we can dock it. Okay. So uh, let's take just these four wooden footsteps right here. And with them all highlighted, I'm going to drag them as a group with my left mouse button holding it down over the tab. And then without letting go of the mouse, I'm going to drop them into the graph area. OK? And uh, uh, one of the nice things about sound cues is that we can randomize these sounds simply by highlighting them and dragging a random node from the palette into the uh, sound cue graph. If I don't have all these highlighted first, you'll have to hook them up individually, okay? And if I connect the output pin to the final output of the sound cue and then play the cue, you can see what this does. Hopefully your speakers or headphones are loud enough to hear these. They're a little bit quiet. So uh, let's, uh, well, I'll, I'll adjust their, their uh, levels later. Um, but uh, if I play the cue every time I press this button, Sounds like somebody with kind of like some busy shoes walking on wood, okay? All of these were recorded in the DAW, but of course they had to be separated. They were physically different steps taken by a human and uh, just edited carefully. By edited carefully, I mean really, really carefully, okay? Uh, for those of you who know the term leadering, digital leadering, that means trimming off any unneeded excess silence at the beginning is incredibly important. Okay, because uh, unless you zoom in close enough, you might not see it, and it can indeed uh, throw off timing. Okay, so be careful of that. Let's layer these with uh, Vince's footsteps, which are right here. 
I, I may not use all of these. Some of them are sand and rocks and things of that nature. So they were just in the same folder. And I'll drop these here as well. Excuse me. If I draw a marquee around them, I can move them as a group. And I can do the same thing as before. I can do I can drag in a random node, and that will randomize these. Okay. Uh, but notice that uh, the final output can only accept one or the other. Let's say I want to layer them. I'm going to need a mixer. All right. So we're going to take our mixer into the sound queue. Uh, the output from this first random node can go into A, and the output from this random node can go into B. And then uh, even before I reach the final output for further variation, I think I'm going to bring in a modulator node. Uh, modulator, the modulator node in sound cues is not like a continuous LFO, okay? It's just going to operate on each reiteration of the sound. Uh, there is a continuous LFO that you can use, but for this, we don't want that. I don't want to hear pitch changing as the sound is being played. I just want each iteration of the sound to uh, be modulated up or down in pitch, maybe also in amplitude. So we'll connect that there. And for the modulator node, the properties are pitch min, pitch max, volume min, and volume max. And you can see that they've got some default settings that are already not bad. If I were to exaggerate these, let's suppose that I set this to 0.5 and this to 10. <laughs> this is going to be rather ridiculous, but I'll let you hear what the cue would sound like. excuse me, uh, let's say negative five. <laughs> I want to make this really crazy. Uh, all right, so you can see that the default values are pretty good. You can exaggerate them more in terms of uh, volume and pitch if you wish. But this is, of course, just to make it so that every footfall sounds a little different, you know, from uh, any other footfall. Uh, I also feel that uh, uh, in B, which is really index one here, these ones, if I play the node, these are the ones that Vince recorded in class. And I don't think any of them are loud enough. So let's select the mixer and just increase the volume multiplier uh, for index uh, one and lower it a little bit for index two and just balance these. And hopefully by sight, you can see what's happening there. Uh, we're getting quite a bit of randomization. And with enough samples, round robin randomization plus modulation will usually prevent uh, the listener from detecting repetition. So we're going to save this sound cue, and now we're going to implement it for our character. It's called footsteps cue, so that's going to be useful to remember. Let's go back now to our um, animation blueprint for the character that you're using. By the way, here's a tip. If you ever forget which animation blueprint you're using for a given character, if you have lots of characters or pawns in your map, uh, you can always go to the character blueprint, go to the viewport, and look at what blueprint the mesh is using. This one is using uh, this animation blueprint. I can click the Browse to Asset and Content Browser, and I can find exactly which animation blueprint it's using. That's very, very useful. So I'm going to double click that to open it up. And we're still in the Anim graph. But what we want is to be in the Event graph in this case. And uh, we're going to be making use of those notifies. And I can search for them by name by right-clicking in, in the animation uh, event graph and searching for it by name. Footfall, I just typed foot. And uh, let's see, uh, event anim notify footfall. These are other ones I think that probably came with the template. But this is the one that I made myself, OK? So there's our anim notify footfall. From here, we're going to cast. This is, uh, there's not just one way to do anything, okay, in Unreal Engine, but this is very direct cast to our, our character. Now, we have to remember what that character was called. That's BP underscore, excuse my typo, 
tax base. Uh, third, wait a second, cast the, no wonder it's not populated, cast two, BP third person character, and it's this one right here, that's the only one that I need. In an anim graph, the object that it's looking for, even though it's a mystery, uh, is uh, try get pawn owner. And by the way, uh, just for me, and I've had people disagree with me on this, uh, a lot of people say, wow, that's weird language. Try get pawn owner. That's not very intuitive. Uh, so sometimes I try to make things a little bit more intuitive just by rearranging the words. If you were to swap, and I'm sure maybe Epic Games would not approve of this, so uh, and let me know if this is, is not something that meets with your standards. But what I do in my mind is I reverse uh, the last two words. Try get owner pawn, okay? And the owner of this pawn is the uh, third person, is the uh, player character, okay? Uh, so, in any case, that's just how I make it simpler for myself. I do the same thing with audio concepts like RMS, root means squared. Uh, little devices to help people understand that better. I, I say, insert the words of the in between each one of the letters. The root of the mean, of the squares, right? The root meaning the square root of the mean, which is the linear average of all those voltages or sample points. Uh, and uh, squared is just squared, okay? So you take the square root of uh, all the positive and negative voltages in, uh, along every point of a waveform, uh, you average them, and then you square that average, and you're going to get the RMS value for whatever function it happens to be. Uh, so little things like that make you know, a difference sometimes uh, in conceptualizing these things, especially when it comes to abstract concepts like coding and writing script. So cast a blueprint uh, third person character. And what we want to do in this case is to play a sound. The sound we want to play is our footfalls cue. So let's look for that foot. Uh, uh, you know what? I forgot what it was called. You know what? I'm just going to go back to our, let's dock this. And I just have to remember what it was called. Beg your pardon. Oh, it also looks like I didn't save that blueprint yet. So let's save it. And go back to where I have that uh, sound cue. And it's footfalls cue. Okay, so let's go back here. And uh, we are going to, we could use play sound 2D. And we can also use play sound at location. I think play sound at location is probably better in most cases, especially in case it has to replicate so that uh, multiplayer games, uh, that your footsteps are spatialized, just like anybody else's, okay? So I'm going to choose either play sound at location or spawn sound at location. The main difference being if you spawn the sound at the location, then the... Uh, uh, output uh, return value is going to be an object reference for that uh, particular sound. And we don't need that in this case. So we'll just choose play sound at location. And of course, um, uh, I could have chosen this, but this is uh, all I need for the present uh, example. And that asset is going to be a sound cue. We're going to make this as a meta sound also, just so you can learn how to do that too, because the process is different. So foot something, I already forgot again, but I'll find it, I'm sure. Footfalls cue, okay? And it needs to know what at what location. So the easiest way for me to do this, now that I've cast to the third person character, um, you know, its capsule really determines its location, so I can just pull off as third person character, and I can ask for the location. Get actor location, like this. Make sure for transformation, don't make the mistake of clicking the first one that's highlighted. It's this one on the bottom, get actor location. That's the one that you need. This is a struct, and it is a vector with X, Y, and Z coordinates. You can split the struct if you need to, but we do not need to at this point. Okay, That just provides, uh, that provides the uh, location of the actor. Okay, So if we compile this and save this, it should just uh, automatically play footsteps as we walk. So let's find out. We're going to go ahead and play. And 
there are also uh, uh, plays that uh, uh, footstep when I land from a jump. Ooh. I probably uh, would also put in something for the jump start if I weren't being lazy, okay? Uh, or maybe even something like a vocalization, like a huh, you know, huh, a sound you make when you jump. <laughs> Um, but right now our footstep system is working, at least with regard to um, what you call them, sound cues. Let's now do the same thing with a meta sound. Okay, so we're going to do custom audio 01, Foley footsteps. I'm going to make a new folder in here called Foley footsteps uh, 02. Under, oh, actually, uh, the, the sort of the new the new preference in uh, naming conventions is M M M S S underscore okay M S S underscore Foley footsteps. Uh, the most basic asset type that we make using MetaSound is called a MetaSound source, and that is what M S S stands for. So we'll go into that folder, and I'm going to. Hey, I uh, hear. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Andrew asked, what was the last thing you connected to the blueprint? Yeah. That last little like node thing. This one get here? actor location. Yeah. Yeah. Get actor location that is stored in the uh, object reference for the as third person blueprint character. Okay. So once I have access to that character, I can get its location and feed that into the location pin for the play sound at location so that the sound will spawn where it's supposed to in the world. Okay, thanks. Just want to make sure I got that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, of course. Uh, interrupt me anytime you wish, please. Okay, so I'm going to compile and save that just in case I haven't and uh, go back to my character. Let's see, what am I going back to? We're going to go back to uh, MSS Foley footsteps, and we're going to do this a different way. We're going to go back to sounds just like we did before, but if we if we enable the MetaSound plugin and restarted our editor, we also have this MetaSound source uh, option. I have to say that MetaSound uh, is more complicated than sound cues. But it turns out that it's worth it. Um, if you've spent years using sound cues and have found that you're frustrated by, uh, you know, wishing that you could parameterize certain things uh, and it just being very, very roundabout ways of doing that, uh, there are more ways in MetaSound uh, to parameterize all kinds of things. Everything that we can do in sound cues can be done in MetaSound. And also MetaSound has DSP capabilities, modular synthesis capabilities. You can do a fair amount of the sound design itself inside of a MetaSound source. Uh, today we're going to keep it simple and we're just going to try to replicate some of the things that we already do uh, just to make the growing pains a little bit less miserable. Okay, So we're going to type MSS underscore... Uh, I guess, character fully. And we'll just worry about the footsteps for today. We can have multiple uh, of these, uh, multiples of these. You know, some of it can be the footsteps, some of it can be the clothing or the uh, noise that the character, you know, uniform or armor might make or, uh, you know, flowing robes and capes and things of that nature. But today we're going to focus on just the, uh, the footsteps. So we'll open up our meta sound source here, and uh, there's some things that are not like sound cues. So let's dock this and look around a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, this node that says unfinished, and there's a warning. Okay, uh, this has to do with whether or not we're making a one-shot sound source or something that might need to be looping. Okay. So since we're doing footsteps here, each footstep unto itself is a one shot. So I'm not going to delete this. If we wanted that node to go away, we would just delete that interface, okay? The uh, one shot interface and that would disappear. Ultimately, we are gonna have to connect it to something if we leave it in and I'm going to leave it in because these are one shot types of sounds. One of the things that we're going to need in this graph is a wave player. Wave players do exist in sound cues also, although the node is different and has other features in MetaSound. 
So let's uh, right click just as we might in other graphs and type wave player and uh, we'll find it. Don't accidentally click wave shaper. And by the way, one day just look at, you know, just, just explore the menus of MetaSound and you're going to get astonished. I mean, there are even things like ladder filters in here uh and all pass filters and there's there's so much potential for uh dsp and uh things that uh you just can't do in metasound but in this case we're going to make a wave player like so okay uh and uh, you can see this is different in appearance from the wave players that are in uh, sound cues if it's a one shot if you haven't deleted that uh, interface that one shot interface please connect on finished to the unfinished pin uh, here, okay, on the output there, okay? You'll also notice this node, which is an audio output, but there's a left and right output from the wave player. If this is a mono sound source, as you probably know, you would just use the left output and that would be okay. If it happens to be a stereo file, which is in many, uh, you know, at least for uh, uh, 3D sounds, sounds that have to seem like they're originating from a particular location, those are oftentimes just mono sounds. But let's say you have a 2D sound like music. Uh, in that case, you would want your meta sound to be stereo and it does default to mono, okay? So uh, if I want my meta sound to be stereo instead of mono, I click on the gear icon right here and set the output to stereo instead of mono. I'm not going to change it in this case. And in the future, multi-channel options are going to appear in this list in uh, 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 subsequent uh, revisions of uh, uh, Unreal Engine 5, OK? Uh, so we're not just stuck with mono and stereo forever. But for now, mono is going to work out. And uh, we're going to set up another input here. Uh, so I'm going to look for the inputs tab and use the plus button. And the plus button is going to, I'll rename it if it lets me. I'm having a little bit of problems with my mouse today. I don't know if that has anything to do with, uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with this meeting interface, but, uh, now that I've got there, we're going to call this footsteps. All right. So that input is going to be uh, a uh, wave. Okay. So let's search for wave asset. Okay. Wave asset. And uh, it's uh, going to be an array. So this is not really obvious unless you pull this over. Can you see that little checkbox that says is array? Why is array? Because uh, it's going to have multiple uh, waves in it, okay? So let's go check. Let's just use uh, some of the footsteps there. I'll go into custom audio once again, Foley footsteps. And let's say we want to use just the uh, uh, these ones. Oh, no, I don't like those. Oh, that's distorted for some reason. Uh, that's too bad. Something, maybe I'll check uh, the buffer size on my, uh... oh no, I'm not using my audio interface. Okay, so hopefully that will resolve. Yeah, some sort of weird artifact. Can you hear that on your end? Would anybody please confirm if that's audible on your end? Tolly? I'm not noticing the... any artifacts. Yeah, suddenly the audio is extremely distorted. Oh, could you play play those again? Yeah, I, I can't understand what you're saying even a little. Oh. If there's a setting you can change or something in the meeting settings that would uh, alleviate that, um, maybe that would help. I don't think it's Unreal Engine. Yeah, no, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's the host program either because we're you sound fine to us. Yeah. Okay, so as long as I sound fine to you and you can hear all this stuff the way it's supposed to sound, I guess I'll just put up with it. Uh, but let me know if this, uh, if my voice or any of these sound effects sound really, really abnormal, okay? Because on my end, they do. They're very, very badly distorted. But they're not. I know that they're not within the engine. So let's go back to the meta sound, and we're going to set our footsteps to an array. 
and we have to now add array elements and populate this array with the sounds that we're going to use. So let's again look. Uh, I already forgot. I think it was six, right? It was six different uh, footfalls that we were going to use. So let's go ahead and populate that populate that array uh, with uh, five more elements. Well, actually, six elements. One, two, three, four, five, six. And now we can either drag them in from our content browser, or I can just look for them. So what were they called? They were called uh, footfall one through six. Okay, so that's easy enough for me to remember. We'll just type footfall one. This is going to be terribly exciting. Footfall two. I saw a trick recently where you could drag them all in on top of this at once, and they all went in in order, and uh, I forgot how to do it. So <laughs> apologies there. Footfall three. Yeah, it's just a little productivity hack. Footfall four. Footfall five. And footfall six. Okay. So uh, here is that footsteps input, and I can just drag it right into the graph, and we can see that it is an array just by that symbol there. Okay. When I'm choosing my wave asset to play, I want to do a random get, a random get from this array. All right, so let's see if I can get it from here. Uh, random, yeah, random get is one of the only functions that I even have available to me. Okay, so we're going to use a random get. And uh, our main input will be connected to next to trigger that. And then out of on next, that will play the wave player, okay, like so. The wave asset is going to be the return value of the random get from the array. So that is going to go to the wave asset pin on the wave player. Since this is mono and not stereo, let me just check that. Yeah, okay, it's still, <laughs> it's still uh, uh, mono, okay, so I can just take the left output here and connect that to out mono. Okay, now this is called MSS Character Foley. So let's save that. And I want to talk to you now about the implementation of a meta sound compared to the implementation of a uh, sound cue. The good news is that the, the implementation is not that different. Okay, so I can go back uh, to uh, my animation blueprint. Okay, so here's my character. We will browse to that asset and uh, go back into the animation blueprint for that character. Here at the play sound location, I now have another asset that I can use, which is called MSS character foley, okay? No different, okay? In terms of the implementation, it's just a different type of asset. It's not a sound cue anymore. It is now a meta sound source. So we'll hit compile and save, and we should get rather similar results here. Okay, so let's go and see. I didn't layer them in this case, and I could have. I could have used two wave players and two arrays and a mixer node. I could have done all those things. Likewise, and boy, is that distorted on my end for some reason. Likewise, in the meta sound itself, uh, let's see, uh, we can also do some modulation. So let's get back into custom audio and go back into that meta sound source. Uh, this works something more like blueprint in this case uh, because the pitch shift value, excuse me, the pitch shift value is just a float. Okay, so we can type, well, if this were a regular blue, uh, blueprint, we would probably do something like random float in range, but I just have to type random float, I think in this case, random float, and, uh, and just specify the minimum and maximum, okay? So uh, what we'll do is on next, we'll go into here. We actually don't have to do that technically, uh, so I changed my mind. This will function even without going through it. Uh, and uh, we'll just uh, specify the min as 0.95 and the max as 1.05, which, by the way, are the default values for the modulator node that is inside of sound cues. 
okay? So we've got this random float, and uh, oh, something happened here. Let's see, the wave player input. What happened to my array? Something happened. Random get. Did anybody see what I did? I don't know what I did. But anyway, there's our random get, and uh, there's that, and there's that, and there's that. And because it's a one shot, we've got unfinished, unfinished. And uh, uh, we shouldn't need to connect on next to play here to trigger it, okay? It's already going to be playing. And I will exaggerate this uh, a little bit here. Uh, let's say negative 5 and 10, just to make sure that we do not have to connect those pins. And I don't think that we do, okay? So this should sound really wacky once I go into play. Can I, I hope everybody can hear the fact that the pitch shift is way too much, okay? So let's set this back to uh, 0.95 or something more uh, in scope, okay? 1.05, it's oh, okay? Save and browse, uh, not browse, excuse me, just save. Not not a compile and save. I'm, us I'm used to going compile save all the time, right? As we all are. So that's a basic meta sound. Uh, and you can see that it's a little bit less, uh, 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 maybe uh, there's a little bit more to do in a meta sound, I suppose. Meta sounds can belong to sound classes. Meta sounds can also have concurrency assets and con concurrency overrides made for them. Uh, you can also override their spatialization, make them 2D or 3D. You can render them uh, through panning or binaurally. If you have B format files, you can even make uh, Ambix. Ambisonics files will work in Unreal uh, uh, Meta sounds, I think, by now. Uh, if not now, uh, it's going to be in the future. Uh, if you have the resonance plugin for Unreal Engine 5, uh, for Unreal Engine, I think that is currently available uh, and working with Unreal Engine 5. I'd have to confirm that. I have it. Uh, that is a binaural rendering plugin. So if you have Ambisonics files, but they're being uh, rendered binaurally, all you need is a pair of headphones, and you will hear the Ambisonics in its full glory. Another nice thing about the Resonance plugin is that it comes with lots and lots of pretty high quality uh, sampled acoustics impulse responses that you can use inside of your reverb volumes inside of Unreal Engine. Okay, so uh, that is uh, more or less the main thing that I wanted you to see today is just how to do with a meta sound what we might ordinarily do with uh, a sound cue. So let's just do one more, and we're going to make this one a music loop, okay? So I'm not going to bother making the sound cue this time, but I will make a new folder, and I will call it music. Loop uh, 001, uh, that's fine, okay? And we'll put that in there. And uh, I believe I've got some music that I can just bring into here. Uh, Well-trimmed loop for now. Dynamic music we'll talk about on another day and setting uh, sound cue parameters based on uh, variables, you know, things like health variables or danger variables that come from other actors. Uh, that took time only because this is on a spinning drive that took time to spin up. The project is on an SSD, so this is not what I want. I want some music that might be on my desktop. Do, 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 do. Uh, let's see. In here, okay, so here is a music loop. Okay, I can't drag and drop, but I can highlight that and just open it. Okay, so this is just a raw wave file. The asterisk indicates, again, that it has not been saved. But there's something I need to modify first. I'm going to open that up and make sure that looping is checked. OK? That's important. And if we have to do any overrides or use any assets to override things like attenuation or you know uh, anything else for that matter, uh, we could do that here if we wanted to. But uh, we can also do it for the entire meta sound. So now let's make another meta sound source. Okay, so let's go uh, sounds, meta sound source, and this is going to be called music 
uh, I'm sorry, MSS underscore. I'm still getting used to the new naming conventions, by the way. And incidentally, if you come up with a naming convention that makes sense to you and would make sense to other people, it's not so important what that naming convention is as long as it's you know, something that somebody else could look at and understand what you mean. So MSS, Metasound Source, underscore, music, 001, okay? And I think that that's uh, okay. Open up the Metasound Source. The music was a WAV file, and it is in stereo, so I want to prepare this in advance. One thing I can do right off the bat is click on the gear icon and change the output format to stereo, okay? This is going to require a wave player because it was a wave file. So uh, in this case, it's not going to require uh, an array. It's going to be one asset, and it's the asset that I imported, which was something C, section C loop. Okay, so that doesn't need anything in terms of an array or another input. So when this is triggered, it's just going to play, and I'm going to tip the looping, tick the looping icon. This is not going to be a one-shot sound. This is going to be a looping sound. So let's delete the one-shot interface, which is going to make this node disappear, which is what we want. And now, because we set the meta sound to be stereo, we have a left output and a right output. And this can be for music or sound effects or, or whatever it needs to be. Okay, so let's preview this. And this, by the way, these meters can give you an idea of how low I bounce out my audio assets. Because I never really know whether or not they're going to be boosted or ever summoned to mono for any reason, in which case the center channel is going to get a lot louder due to constructive interference. And I don't want to approach digital clipping. I always want to have headroom. Uh, even though uh, final delivery specs for video games is kind of the Wild West, the industry is pushing for some loudness standardizations. And as the closest we are right now is the recommendation that is very, very similar to the ITU recommendation, which is close enough to ATSC 885 here in the United States, which is a final output level of the entire mix being approximately negative 23 or negative 24 LKFS. So you will want to have access to something like a broadcast loudness meter, and they do exist for Unreal Engine, by the way. You can go on the marketplace and find them. Right now, this is just showing me my stereo mix levels, which is fine. I would assume that as uh, we get more into multi-channel in Unreal, we'll possibly have some more built-in tools uh, that can show us uh, more detail about our cumulative uh, levels. Uh, including if they are multi-channel or contain LFE and have a separate uh, lane for the center channel and whatnot. Um, but uh, the way that you're going to measure it for a game is just play the game for an hour or so. Because unlike uh, feature films or TV shows, there's no anchor element when measuring the final uh, delivery uh, output level for a video game. Uh, in a feature film or a TV show, it would be a gated measurement meaning that it's, a, it's an integrated measurement over long term, but it pauses measuring any time dialogue is not detected in the center channel. Video games are not like that. They measure all channels, uh, including LFE, through the K-weighting filter network and give you that final long-term integrated average. So play the game for an hour or two and let it measure the whole time. Okay, if by the time you're done, you're somewhere around negative 23 or negative 24, that might be about right. But having said that, not everybody in the video game sound design industry even thinks about that sort of thing, much less knows about it. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm afraid the loudness wars are still a thing. So if somebody wants to cheat the system, nothing is stopping them. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, beware of that. Uh, you could do your mix louder if you wanted to, but I'm always uh, in favor of, uh, I don't know about you, I don't know how you personally feel about it, but I don't think the loudness wars are productive in music or in video gaming. People always have the ability to turn up their volume knob, and I don't want to have to sacrifice things like uh, dynamic range and distortion and nonlinearity only in the name of loudness right i want all the dynamic range and impact 
that my that is effective for my video game and that's going to be a lot more than most popular music releases these days if you've ever looked at the crest factor for a popular music release these days and for those of you who don't know crest factor is the difference between the rms and the absolute sample peak level uh, you'd be amazed if they use more than 4 db of dynamic range and I find that ridiculous because even a compact disc is uh, capable, idealized uh, compact disc is capable of, you know, about 97.76 dB of dynamic range, not to mention 24-bit audio. So most people haven't even ever been exposed to how good it can sound with that kind of dynamic range. So no, I'm not going to compress the snot out of this unless it's absolutely necessary. But uh, this should be fine, and we'll save. And uh, I think that what we're going to find is that when I use this asset and place it into the world and it becomes an audio actor, I bet the details panel, and I might be wrong about this, but I bet it has an auto activate button. It's probably on by default. Auto activate right there. Okay, so all I have to do is enter my game now. Of course, I can't hear my footsteps now, so I could reopen this queue and adjust the gain, or again, I can do it in the, de in the details panel. As long as I've got that asset highlighted, I can set the volume multiplier to something a lot lower. Maybe even lower. Or I could crash Unreal Engine <laughs> altogether. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to get back into the meeting here for a second. I think everybody here knows what I was about to try. Okay, so I am going to see if I can stop the share and if we're still here in the meeting. Okay, so now I'm back into GoTo. Uh, is anybody still around? I hope uh, so. Yeah, we're still here. Okay, good. All right. So uh, we could go further. We could import, for example, animations into that, uh, into that uh, Unreal project and implement the animations. Uh, we could do vocalizations. We can do sound effects. We can do all of that. Um, but the basics of using MetaSound Source as something rather similar to what we're accustomed to in sound cues is not that bad. What is very exciting about MetaSound, however, is the fact that it's got way more features, number one. Like I said, it can be used as a standalone uh, 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 DSP graph. It can be used as a standalone modular synthesizer. You can even, you can, I, I could make a sampled instrument using Metal, uh, MetaSound if I wanted to. Uh, let's say a virtual drum machine or something along those lines from scratch, even without samples. And procedural audio yeah. uh, is an incredible implementation of, of MetaSounds and MetaSynth um, and all these new features that I'm really just starting to come to grips with. We just started our first five project, uh, official five project, not a conversion or an upgrade or a flip too, but uh, looking forward to playing with all this stuff. So I'm definitely grateful for your, your tutelage, Ben. So I'm just oh, you're quite out. welcome. You know, and even the use cases of uh, procedural audio to avoid licensing costs and different stuff, right? Um, oh, we can we can set up anything really in MetaSound. It's it's and, amazing. And uh, it also has uh, what I think Epic might be calling a universal parameter bus. So we can set up things that are are. Uh, if you're familiar with, for example, middleware, I don't know if any of you have ever used something like FMOD, for example. Uh, FMOD is something that is uh, audio middleware that will work with game engines, and uh, uh, it has the ability to basically parameterize any feature in the program, and then dynamically link that parameter to any variable in the game engine. So, for example, if I have a health parameter on a character, as that health parameter dwindles down and down and down, I can have things that change in the music to cue the player that uh, they're in trouble, that they're dying. Uh, I can make the heartbeat get louder. I can make the breathing get heavier. You know, all of those things that provide the necessary audio feedback to our players 
uh, can be parameterized. And it's my understanding that uh, we can do all of that and more in MetaSound now. Uh, one thing I'm looking forward to, and one thing that I do appreciate still to this day about FMOD is the music logic track. But it occurred to me a couple of days ago that if I incorporate enough things and if this turns out to be efficient, what I'm going to try to do as an experiment is to create something equivalent to the music logic track in FMOD with the assistance of Sequencer and uh, the uh, blueprint, the director blueprint for sequencer using MetaSound as well. And I want to see if I can create something just as useful as the music logic track in FMOD using nothing but sequencer and MetaSound. Uh, I'm really, really excited about trying that. And uh, whether or not it'll work will have to, remains to be seen. But I think it's possible. And I'll get Quartz involved as well so that uh, you know we can make uh, transitions right on the bar line and uh so that there's not just you know random music transitions they don't have to be covered up with a sound effect or something like that or crossfaded so it just happens right on the beat right picks up right up where it's supposed to right so uh that's what i'm uh, uh planning on working on next but if you're a sound designer and you know you uh, you should already know how to use a daw you should already know how to make music you should already know how to use signal processing plugins and create sound effects, either using practical techniques with microphones and then processing them and editing them after the fact, or starting with something from a, a sound effects collection. Please don't asset flip if you can help it, all right? Do something to the sound to make it your own, okay? Even if you didn't record it yourself, there's so much we can do with signal processing and manipulation that uh, what you end up with doesn't sound anything like what you started with. Uh, I've made so many sound effects that uh, you would never know what they were in the first place. Uh, and I don't illegally jack sound effects from anything. Uh, there are free sound effects that you can get from the internet that are not great, but after you have your way with them, they might become great, okay? Uh, and there are also uh, sound effects libraries that are good to have. Uh, in the 90s, I made what I still consider to be a really good purchase, which was a sound effects collection called the Hollywood Edge Collection, Premier Edition. I still have that. When it came out, it was on compact disc. I got multiple boxes of compact discs, different volumes. And now when they sell it, they sell it on a hard drive. And every single file in the Hollywood Edge collection contains uh, metadata in the form of search terms. So if you're a Pro Tools user, for example, and you know how to use the Workspace browser, OK, uh, or the new uh, Waves product, I think, I forgot what it's called, but there is a new Waves product that like categorizes or catalogs all your, all your audio samples on all your drives and makes them available in one place. So I would either use a, a, a workspace browser or that new Waves thing uh, and uh, you know, audition the different uh, sound effects that I have, find something that perhaps is most similar to the finished sound I have in mind, and then have my way with it, with signal processing and layering and uh, all the things that sound designers do. Uh, if I have the opportunity to do something in a practical sense, I will, because that way I know for sure that it's a sound that nobody's ever heard before. Oftentimes I start with synthesizers and uh, you know make something from absolute scratch. And in my own DAW, I've got no shortage of synthesizers. I mean, I've got everything. And uh, for other types of music, uh, I use things like the Spitfire Orchestra and uh, you know the uh, East West. I've got the East West Composer Cloud, and for, you know, like for realistic sounding stuff or epic orchestral music. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, I use anything to make a sound effect. There have been times that I've had to create a magic spell that goes, whoosh, but I start with a snare hit. <laughs> You know, and I start processing it and messing with it until it sounds like the magic spell that it needs to be. Right. And uh, that's just regular old sound design. And if you've ever done sound design for other purposes, you probably know how to do those things already. And if not, if you'd like to see some just sound design tips, I'm always happy to do a talk on that as well. And that can apply to video games 
as well as linear post and to slot machines and to user interfaces in vehicles and uh you know, in, in this day and age, uh, Unreal technology is being used in everything, in everything. I, I like to tell the story about the African surgeon a few years ago who completed the very first middle ear, successful human middle ear transplant, wore a VR headset, the whole user interface designed in Unreal Engine. I don't think the surgeon ever physically touched the patient, but probably had auditory feedback. Right, would would need a, somebody that knows audio implementation and how to make it an okay experience for the surgeon. You want you probably want somebody that knows something about what makes sound not irritating <laughs> and provide the right kind of feedback. Right, uh, it just you know it never stops. I think uh, you know all of the electric vehicles made by Volvo now are having their infotainment systems and heads-up displays. Uh, uh, you know, made with uh, Unreal technology and more. It just doesn't end, okay? And almost uh, every UX experience or UI experience requires sound design, not to mention games, not to mention feature films, not to mention everything else in the world that Unreal Engine is capable of. And in my opinion, Unreal Engine is capable of anything one can imagine and everything that one cannot imagine. Okay, so uh, we have the ultimate sandbox. So I apologize for that crash, but maybe that was, uh, uh, you know, a good time to wrap it up unless anybody has some Q&A they want to get over with. Uh, I'm happy to stick around for a little while and answer some questions if I if I can. But, uh, you know, Vince, uh, I hope you don't, and Paul, thank you for being here. Uh, they are both uh, uh, students that are in the game audio classes or have taken the game audio classes at my university, Lawrence Tech University. And how was that? Uh, excuse me, Paul, I think you were my student at a different college. Is that right? And I've also given Paul some uh, like uh, private lessons. He might be off right now. But Vince, does your microphone work yet? Nah. <laughs> Oh, well, OK, I thought Vince could talk us <laughs> could talk us up. But give me a hands up if you feel like, uh, you know, instead of using a random node, could you make an array uh, in Metasound and randomize it and modulate the pitch and stuff like that? I mean, these are some of the very common things that we do. And soon you're going to learn how to use things like float parameters and timelines and stuff like that if you ever have to, like, lerp pitches and things for car engines and stuff like that. All of that is a lot easier to do, believe it or not, in MetaSound because anything can be promoted to a parameter, just like we promote things to variables in Blueprint, right? Uh, and once it's a parameter, you can just uh, get that audio component. And as long as you spell the parameter name correctly, you can link it up. <laughs> and that's copy paste, OK? As long as you do that, oh, your microphone isn't working, Paul. I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, as long as you know how to do that already for something like FMOD or a sound cue, uh, you already know how to do it pretty much for uh, MetaSound, okay? It's just naming the parameter and deciding uh, it's just set float parameter, okay, in a, in a blueprint uh, graph once you have the uh, audio component and the parameter name. Okay, that you need to modulate. And it can be stepped with an integer or it can be smooth uh, with uh, timelines, things of that nature, or LERPs. So uh, uh, we have a lot, lot, lot of flexibility and a lot to look forward to uh, in terms of features that are coming to Unreal Engine uh, with regard to sound that. Uh, are not even something that I can talk about at the moment. There's lots of things in store for us that I just can't wait to see. And uh, Grace knows what I'm talking about because she's with Epic, but uh, uh, we have a very bright future ahead uh, as sound designers in inside of Unreal Engine. So um, I hope this talk was uh, useful to some of you and uh, you feel less intimidated moving over to Unreal Engine 5. You know, for somebody who's just an audio designer, sometimes things can be intimidating. I will tell you that even in Blueprint scripting, some things are different, but the ways in which they're different tend to be better. Uh, for example, raise your hand if you've ever done a vector plus vector inside of a Blueprint. You don't have to do that anymore. OK, so if you have a vector value and you want to do like vector arithmetic, 
you just pull off the vector node. It will do the conversion for you. Just type the word add or plus. It knows it's a vector. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's amazing. You know, it's like, okay, of course, you know, simplify it, right? We don't have to think about vector plus vector or something like that anymore. Just add, and it knows it's a vector, and it does the conversion for you. So I've been finding those things that the more I've been working with Unreal Engine 5, I was like, where is vector plus vector? I spent way too much time looking for that. And then out of exasperation, I just said plus, and there it was. And I just clicked add, because uh, that's what pops up when you hit plus. And, and it, it was a vector. I mean, you know, lo and behold, I thought, great, I don't have to worry about what kind of data it is anymore, you know? Brilliant. So uh, it's, it's really, really brilliant. Uh, so you're going to love working with Unreal Engine 5. Get used to the layout. It's a little weird. One of the layouts you can choose, by the way, uh, in that window menu is the default UE4 layout. So if you're really struggling with the current layout, maybe uh, in the interim you can use the UE4 layout. I decided to just jump into the new layout and rip the Band-Aid off, try to get used to it as, as quickly as I could. All right, so uh, that's where we stand. And this fall, when I resume the game audio classes, Vince, have, uh, raise your hand if you've been through both of them. Yeah, Vince has been through both. Uh, I don't think Paul, Paul, we've met up. Paul was my student at a different institution I taught at previously, I think. Uh, and uh, if you sign up for the game audio classes, we'll be using a combination of Unreal Engine 4, the latest version, and also Unreal Engine 5, okay? Because certain things might be a little bit easier to take in as information, at least for the time being in Unreal Engine 4. But of course, we're going to use them both. We're going to use them both and also middleware, so you'll get exposed to everything. Brilliant. All right. So, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. I know that you're not my personal student at uh, Lawrence Technological University. Is, is that something that may change in the future? Um, well, I'm mainly just looking for, for work and uh, like trying to improve my, um, my, my skills yeah. uh, for right now. But I, I don't know, maybe sometime in the future. But yeah, I, I can't. Uh, Sorry, sorry, Ben. You said you were originally, or you went to school in Vancouver, or something like that, or are you from Michigan, or are you out of state? Um, yeah, I went to. Uh, okay, I live in North Carolina. Um, nice. I'm back. I'm back here in North Carolina, and I went to Vancouver Film School for their year-long sound design and visual media program. It was very, it was very intense, um, quite stressful as it went on, but. Ultimately, I'm very glad I did it. Made a lot of connections, learned a lot of stuff, um, and yeah, I'm just trying to improve my skills and find uh, find some good work. Did Excellent. you? Uh, I forgot. I think you mentioned this earlier, and I didn't quite hear it. Did you say that they also taught you a game engine? Yeah. Um, okay. So they did, they actually t taught us. Uh, okay. So they taught us Wise, FMOD, Unreal, and Unity, but most of the focus was on Wise. Okay, so just on uh, audio, uh, you no. learn how to set up your your audio events in Wise so mm -hmm. that somebody else in a game engine could do the implementation. Um, or do you mean like implementation, like a? Uh, I'll give you an you example. Mean the programming the, side of stuff. The programming, yeah, exactly. The programming okay. side. There, of stuff. there was one scripting class early in the in the term, but it was mostly like in terms of uh, implementation, it was it was mostly uh, pertaining to like setting everything up in Wise and making sure it could connect to yeah yeah, uh, yeah. connect to the game. You know, assuming that somebody else has already programmed it. But you know, I've I've been told time and time again, it's very good to know. C++ and C Sharp, and at some point I want to get into that. Even if you don't, even if you don't, many things can be done in Blueprint, in Unreal Engine, and in Bolt, the visual scripting system of Unity, without needing C++ or C Sharp. Uh, and what I would recommend to you is uh, learning how to create scripted content in whichever game engine you're using so that you can mock up your own gameplay mechanics so that you can sound design for them, 
right? right. Uh, it gives you a way of imagining something, making it happen inside Unreal or Unity or whatever you're using, and then designing your sound around that. I'll give you an example. Let's suppose that I'm designing a dungeon crawl level during which a drawbridge has to lower. So I start thinking about, all right, chains, ropes under strain, creaking wood, you know, you know, these things start to come into my mind. But as I'm programming that, I'm using various things. I'm using, first of all, high quality meshes that look good, because if it looks good, it makes your sound seem better and vice versa. And also when I'm programming the logic, I can decide over what period of time does it take for that drawbridge to fully lower. And even if there's a curve to the acceleration, and once I have that information, now I know what I can do in my DAW. I can go in my DAW. I know this takes four and a half seconds to complete itself. And I make the sound effect four and a half seconds. And then when I trigger it in, in the game, it synchronizes perfectly. And uh, it's just like that goosebump feeling, you know, when you do a uh, linear post. You, you, you find that shotgun sound, uh, the, the, the bullet, you know, the gunshot sound effect in your DAW. And you've trimmed it really well. And then you crawl to the picture frame where you see the muzzle flash and you find out what's empty frame that is. And you spot the sound effect of that empty frame and then you play it and then bam, and the illusion is perfect. If you do that in a video game, it's the same sensation on steroids. Nice. Especially if you create the game mechanics yourself. Pickups, animations, uh, projectiles, okay, laser bolts, for example, versus bullets and missiles, uh, uh, cartoony stuff, uh, different types of footsteps, footsteps that change depending on what you're walking upon, okay? That is all in the realm of implementation also. Of course, we have to create the assets, but we also have to do the programming. And then once you do it, you're like, by golly, I'm walking on rock until I get onto that grass patch. And now it sounds like I'm walking on grass. And then I walk into a puddle and it splashes. And if I walk into that puddle twice, the second splash doesn't sound the same. And neither does any other splash if I step into that puddle, no matter how times I, many times I want. So uh, the more you learn about implementation, uh, it gives you the opportunity to interact with your team better. And it also gives you a way of practicing on your own thinking about things like, how would I design sound for something like this? And then programming something like this and designing sound for it and seeing what you come up with. Okay. So that's what I do. You know, I try to come up with, you know, sometimes I ask children for ideas. That's also a very good idea. You say, like, you ask a five-year-old, what would you want? Imagine something crazy that you would see in a video game. And uh, whatever they say, do that thing. You know, do you know what the most successful video game is in history? Anyone? Like a single video game? Yeah, most successful video game in history. Fortnite. Fortnite is very successful. I don't think it's the most successful video game in history. By the way, Fortnite is an Epic Games uh, game, in case yeah. you didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, how can you not know that, right? But, uh, you know, who knows? The most successful video game, to my knowledge in history, is, um, what's the one? Uh, not Roblox, but Minecraft, okay? Oh. Minecraft, okay? Uh, so that's something like a, something that a child might come up with. And it's casual gameplay. You can play, I think, on mobile. You can be five and be better than your parents at it, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, you know, frankly, uh, it's not that complicated, right? You could design sound for, for uh, Minecraft, for that matter, okay? Uh, and let's suppose that, you know, you were the composer for Minecraft, and you had the right kind of deal that you made with the uh, game dev uh, firm. That, uh, you know, to say that you compose the music for the most successful video game of all time, uh, I think is a pretty good uh, credential. And it wouldn't have been that hard for Minecraft, believe me. Wikipedia says you are correct. Ah, thank you for <laughs> verifying that for me, because I started to get nervous. I, I, was, I was not, I was thinking, oh boy, if I'm wrong, then Grace is going to, I'm going to be embarrassed in front of Grace. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, I don't know who, uh, what, 
was it Epic Games that made Minecraft? I don't know. No, uh, it's no. Uh, it's James. It's Mojang. Mojang. Yeah, we got fought by. Uh, oh, Microsoft. okay. It would have been so much cooler if it was done <laughs> with Unreal. It was made up entirely by one guy. Yeah, no. Oh, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. You could do it. You could do it. You would just need to learn a little bit more, right? It's it's really not that bad, okay? You know, my my money. Uh, I, I don't think I make it. I don't think I keep it a secret. But uh, I I'm really on board with Epic, and uh, I think Unreal Engine and the entire ecosystem is just a miracle. And the fact that it's free, it democratizes everything for anybody that has the talent, the skill, and the uh, dedication to work at it. Now, take my student Vince here, okay? Uh, Vince took one semester. He's taken two semesters of game audio by now. But even after his first week or so of game audio one, he went, Game audio, I never even thought of this. He's getting a, a bachelor's degree in audio engineering from Lawrence Technological University. He took the first week of game audio and he said, and Vince, I hope you don't mind me quoting you on this. He said, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. I never even knew about this. This is what I want to do. And not only does this, did he realize that, he also found out that he has got incredible aptitude for for incredible aptitude for this sort of thing and was making games in his first month or so that took me years to to get to the point where i knew what i was doing enough to do what he was doing That's so fair. uh it's fa it's fabulous and uh we all are so excited about uh you know unreal technology we're trying to bring it to our whole university because really there's nothing that it does not apply to uh, there's nothing. There's nothing that I can think of that Unreal technology does not apply to, and most, if not all, of those things do require some degree of sound design and or music. Hey, Ben, I just want to thank you for all your time today and walking us through, um, you know, teaching us things. I mean, I definitely learned a few things on my end, too. Um, I wanted to just, uh, not to derail anything, but I wanted to just send um, some kind of links along, too, if anyone's interested for inspiration, but I remember we were talking about generating uh, music procedurally recently yeah. and you released numbers of procedural music generated in Fortnite. Um, we're going to have a talk on it at some point and talk about the process of how we, we made this. Um, but just throwing out there that there's kind of some neat stuff. The other thing that I want to just share kind of just for inspiration too is I go across Twitter sometimes and I look at cool demos of things people have built. Um, and I came across this one that was built on top of Metasounds where someone's generating uh, motorcycle engine noises procedurally kind of with Metasounds. So again, just kind of, I think, feeding into that, you know, narrative that you have about how this kind of opens up new tools for people to build really cool things with. Um, there's a ton of stuff out there if you want inspiration, but I want to just share a few that you can have touched on. Can I make a very weird recommendation for anybody that wants to get started with their first, uh, let's say, car or motorcycle engine sounds, and you don't have good, like, steady RPMs to start with for samples that you can uh, that you can crossfade? Is you take an electric guitar or an electric bass and you run it through serious distortion, okay, and then you pluck the note and it sounds blah, really ugly, but it has kind of a pitch to it. And then you do it like in minor thirds, <laughs> and then you can put them together uh, so that they trans they transition from one to another based on something like your velocity or your RPM or whatever uh, variable exists in your vehicle blueprint. Uh, and uh, that's nice because when you pluck a string uh, on a bass guitar through heavy distortion, uh, it stays uh, at one frequency of vibration. So that's like a car that holds one RPM for a little while. And when we're doing car engines, uh, if you look in sound effects collections, it can be frustrating because sometimes you don't have the same vehicle holding the same RPM uh, for long enough for you to get a good loop of it. But if you do it with something like, a, you know, like a sawtooth wave and distortion or a bass guitar or guitar note, uh, that is a good way to learn it. I think so. That's one of the ways that I teach it.
just so they can see what's happening. Yeah, Vince did it. Okay, so he just popped in with that. Yeah, there's so much exciting that's coming in Unreal Engine, and uh, uh, I, I'm just so grateful to be alive at this time where everything is changing. And, uh, 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 you know, Unreal Engine technology is at the heart of so many things. And uh, I, I just, uh, I'm very proud and I'm very, very glad that uh, I learned about this sort of thing when I did. And it, it really helps me appreciate everything else that I see around me now and contextualize what the future might be like. Uh, those of us who can see the future are probably going to be the best prepared for it.